Welcome to our podcast, where I, Keely Severson, Eric Johnson, and Alicia Swamy are exposing mold. Today, we have the honor to interview award-winning science writer, Chris Newby. She has created the documentary, Under Our Skin, and she is the author of the book, Bitten. Wow, I deep dove into your bodies of work, and I'm going to need to read that book a few times. Welcome, Chris. What was, what was... I don't even know where to start with questions because there's just so, really so much. Um, you know, I listened to you describe in your book the way that you were watching Willie's face and the subtle clues that really kind of led you to this discovery. I have to ask you, did you see the videotape of his actual confession? Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I watched it a million times. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that, that was the moment I decided to write the book Bitten about the secret history of Lyme disease and biological weapons. Because it was, it, it just was so obvious that he was wrestling with this, this um, inside this dilemma, should he talk about this secret that he'd kept for years and years about the origins of this illness that broke out, uh, well, he started working on it mid seventies in and around Lyme, Connecticut and Long Island and uh, Cape Cod. So you, yeah. So I watched it over and over again. I read books about reading body language and, you know, normally um, the question that prompted this expression on his face um, was, you know, was this thing that was making people sick, um, around Lyme, Connecticut, did you think it was um, uh, rooted in biological weapons experiments that you worked on 20 years earlier? And, you know, he didn't come out and say, that's ridiculous or anything. It was just like, he, he sat there for a minute. You could see emotion wash over his face. And then he said, yeah, you know, more in German than in English. Uh, and, and then when he thought the camera was off and it wasn't, it was like his face melted in, in grief and remorse. So I, I guess that was when I watched that video tape, um, which was taken by another documentary filmmaker um, who went to Montana to interview him. That was the point where I said, well, I think Willie's telling the truth. And if he is, then I need to bring this tragedy to life because it's really a crime against humanity. Uh, to be working like to to modify living organisms and have them get out somehow and cause disease not just in humans but uh in the ecosystem at large for our audience who may not have watched the documentary under our skin or well or red bitten because that's where most conversation about willie is he just appears briefly in the documentary could you just explain a little bit of background about who Willie is? Yeah, so Willie Bergdorfer was a, a Swiss American scientist who came over here in 1951. He was, before the, my book, he was known as the discoverer of the causative bacteria behind Lyme disease. And uh, after my book, it became clear that he was brought over uh, to be in the chemical and biological warfare program uh, weaponizing fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes for during the Cold War. Like, so basically stuffing these arachnids, uh, arthropods, with dangerous diseases so they could be dropped on our enemies, and they were the perfect stealth weapon. Uh, so he, he worked for the NIH for 35 years here. Uh, and, and so his confession that he believes the outbreak was based on a biological weapon. It carries a lot of waste, weight because he is most famous for being a great scientist who discovered Lyme disease. And, and for him to renege on that is saying, I lied for two decades and uh, held back on the truth. And he was in the program, so he was privy to all the secrets. And I, I had planned to ask you because you, it seemed like the clues and the evidence was just stacking as you went. So one of the questions I wanted to ask was, 
which you may have already answered with the interview, but was, so was the interview like the most convincing piece of evidence or through all this that you dug through because there was just, there's so many puzzle pieces here when you dig through the book bitten, there's so many puzzle pieces. What was, what was the most convincing or the few most convincing things that, that pointed towards this being released as a bioweapon for the cause of illness? Uh, I, I do say in the book, it's like a hundred thousand piece puzzle. And one, one reason I couldn't just publish an article and say, Willie said it was a bioweapon because when you have, uh, an eyewitness testimony standalone, you can't necessarily trust it journalistically. So a lot of it was the five years of finding government documentation to back up the things he said, um, and so, well, really, I had four eyewitnesses who were participants in the program. The first um, participant was a CIA black ops guy who would not release his name, but um, he said he dropped infected ticks on Cuban sugar cane workers in 1962 as one of the many plots to try and dethrone Fidel Castro. Uh, so that was an eyewitness testimony, and I wasn't going to put in, in the book till the JFK files were released, and I saw confirmation of that pilot program that he participated in. So, so I guess the most convincing things are four eyewitness testimonies on various aspects of the program, which were, were really, really secret and compartmentalized, and then adding to that the documentation that supported what they were saying. And then just putting the whole entomological warfare program in context. You know, if, if you say, oh, we stuffed <clears throat> diseases and ticks, it sounds crazy, unless you know this was part of a bigger Pentagon strategy. Right, what, what, I, what I came across online as I was trying to dig for the confession interview was a, a lot of, people like discrediting your body of work as conspiracy, which isn't shocking. But the interesting thing about that is none of them denied that there were massive tick-borne programs to transfer disease. Like that's a fact that's not deniable or disputable. So even the articles that were trying to discredit your body of work were saying, well, this program did exist, but this part of it didn't happen because yeah. we said so, which I just thought was, I mean, that's like the biggest part that it was possible because the program isn't a rumor or isn't conspiracy. That's admitted fact, documented, well-documented. Right, right. And I think when the book first came out and Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey waved the book around and said, hey, this is a really credible book and I think we should investigate this as a way of figuring out why people are sick now. For example, uh, you know, why, why are people sick in Incline Village and Northern Wisconsin and uh, Lyme, Connecticut, weird, freaky disease outbreaks that maybe are natural, maybe not. Uh, so anyways, when Chris Smith said this, I, my book was largely discredited because they did what they did in the beginning of the, Lyme crisis is they had a red herring, a distraction from what really happened in the biological weapons program. So uh, what the discreditor said when the investigation was launched was, well, Lyme disease wasn't a bioweapon. We didn't engineer it. And so what I say clearly in the book is that's what Willie said. It wasn't Lyme disease. It was this other biological weapon. And we use Lyme disease as the fall guy for, yet yeah, everyone is sick because of this one disease and we can cure it easily with doxycycline. And then everybody's saying, oh, sigh of relief. Oh, okay, problem one and done, let's move on. Instead of, well, what else was in the ticks? And that's what Willie told me is there were other things in the ticks, namely a, a relative of the spotted fever bacterium. And I think that was the biological weapon. They were experimenting and messing with Rocky Man and Spotted Fever. So that's what he thought it was. And I don't know if he knew the answer conclusively. Mm -hmm. Eric, you had some interesting things that you wanted to share with Chris.
Yeah, I can uh, tell you quite a bit about Incline Village, what happened back in 1985, because uh, I'm basically Dr. Cheney's first mystery illness patient and eventually went on to become the prototype for Holmes' 1988 chronic fatigue syndrome. So I got to see this entire debacle from the very start. And by a curious coincidence, I happened to be a biowarfare weapons specialist during the Cold War. So that was my background going into this mystery illness epidemic. And I noticed straight off that the um, mystery disease, as it spread across North Lake Tahoe, fit the parameters of a biological weapon. It was exactly what I was trained for. It was suppressing immune function on a broad scale all the way across North Lake Tahoe. And then people were lighting up with various secondary infections, which doctors would blame every time. And I don't know if you've read the book, um, Tick Bites and MS by Bonnie Bennett. Yeah, I read that. You've read that. So mm -hmm. you know that uh, Dr. Komarov came out and investigated in Crime Village and was presented with the evidence of a Borreliosis outbreak at the very same time and place as the mystery illness, which Dr. Komarov and the chronic fatigue syndrome uh, researchers discounted because at the time they were testing using Western blot for Borrelia. And what we found was a relative Borrelia. It was um, Borrelia hermsii which does not show up on PCR. And I've asked uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and Lyme specialists since then, well, if you were testing for Bergdorferi during the Lake Tahoe outbreak, this wouldn't have shown up. You were testing for the wrong thing. And they agreed it would not show up on PCR. So this um, outbreak, the one that spawned the famous controversial syndrome, has never been investigated. And nobody's ever come back to take another look at any of these clues. Yeah, and uh, I've talked to Dr. Jatsna Shaw of Igenix, and she's just come out with really good Hermsii tests, uh, relapsing fever. It's, a, it's related to the Lyme Borrelia, but it's a relapsing fever. So it's uh, fast feeding soft ticks that spread it. But anyways, Igenix is finding there's a lot more Herms EI and, and relapsing fever in Northern California than we'd ever imagined. But that's, that's what was surprising about researching this book is there was a lot of evidence hiding in plain sight, but uh, I, you know, the scientists are a little afraid to ask questions about it or dig too deep because they're funded by the NIH. Um, who originally funded this research along with the military or worked on it. And, um, and yeah, so no one was asking those questions. <laughs> and it's a little bit like COVID. Everyone in the beginning was afraid to ask the questions. Yeah, as you've pointed out, we need a sociological investigation as much as a scientific one, because the behavior of um, researchers has been to ignore research ignore evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So I've been to symposiums of uh, top MECFS researchers, and I've explained how the various viruses that they were finding, HHV6 alpha, EBV, cytomegalovirus, were all secondary to some underlying immune dysfunction. And I explained the circumstances of the outbreak, and they just drop it. They don't want to ask anything. They don't want to discuss anything. They turn and they walk away. Yeah, and it influences how major media covers the story because, you know, major media is on this hamster wheel of 24-hour news cycles and uh, MECFS and Lyme disease and mold, they're complicated. It's confusing. You'll go on the internet and you'll just like tear your hair out. I don't know who's right. Uh, and so... I think it really um, has been a disservice for the patients on getting fair and accurate coverage of the issues. Well, uh, during the outbreak, we were aware of Borrelia burgdorferi, 
and that was a strong candidate for the illness at first until the test showed up negative. Mm -hmm. When Dr. David S. Bell in Lindenville, New York, was having a very similar outbreak at the same exact time in 1985, that was his main culprit. His wife was a Lyme specialist, in fact, made the first diagnosis of Lyme disease in Massachusetts. So the uh, chronic fatigue scene researchers were very interested for a short time until some of the parameters, like the emerging viral infections that caught people's attentions, didn't quite match what they were looking for. So they dropped everything else but the virus and chronic fatigue syndrome went on to become known as a viral illness and all the original evidence was completely discarded. Mm -hmm. So my um, challenge to chronic fatigue syndrome researchers is when you when a researcher gets confused, what's the first rule of science? Go to the beginning. Go back to where the confusion started. Take a look at what happened. Revisit the evidence. And this is what they adamantly refused to do. So that's what we're doing here at Exposing Mold. We're trying to pressure them into doing what researchers are supposed to. Go back to the beginning, start over, and try to work out some of these confusing things. Yeah, and that's what I tried to do with the book in Lyme disease too, is go back to the late 60s when the people, when we first noticed that people were getting ill. And then that's when I realized there were at least three really freaky new tick-borne diseases that, that people had just shoved aside. There was this crazy spotted fever that didn't show up on the regular tests for known bioweapons or regular rickettsias. Um, there was uh, babesiosis, babesia, which is a malaria-like parasite that before that, that year had only been found in cattle. And then there's this Lyme arthritis, which ended up being called Lyme. And they were all novel and caused a lot of disease. But when they discovered Lyme, they just shoved the other ones away. And and so the premise of my book is maybe it's a combination of these tick-borne diseases. Uh, Willie said it, he thought it was a result of an accident related to the bioweapons program. Did these organisms get released and then got into the, the wilds and mutated? And now what, why people have chronic Lyme maybe is a combination of these diseases. Yes, Dr. Paul Cheney was being contacted by doctors from all over the country uh, with this new Epstein-Barr virus syndrome. Mm -hmm. He made a crude map and he plotted it out and he said that the illness started on the East Coast, somewhere mm -hmm. around Massachusetts, and progressed geographically across the United States over about a three-year period before it wound up in Incline Village. Mm -hmm. So that, that matches um, the epicenter theory for how this may have emerged from Plum Island. Not worth that we're saying it's a deliberate bioweapon, but the uh, circumstantial evidence for an accidental release looks very strong. Yeah, and there were, I, what, I, what I do is I go through the book and talk about vulnerability tests. So in order to de develop a bioweapon, there's just a bunch of steps that happen for, um, the entomological program, Willie would get an order from Fort Dedrick, the headquarters of chemical biological weapons and say, hey, we want to look into um, tick paralysis. Can you like try and isolate the proteins that where a tick attaches you and you become paralyzed? You know, so he would do little assignments like that and he would send the results back to F Fort Dedrick in Maryland and they would do larger pilot studies. And then they would start working with the army or, or the Navy and said, so we need to do a field test to simulate how this would be in the field so that army guys, so we could make sure that all the living organisms involved in the biological weapon stay alive during transport, flying in airplanes, dropping them. Um, what kind of food medium should the bacteria have so they'll stay alive? So they did field tests and sometimes things went wrong. Yeah, some people have speculated that the Lake Tahoe outbreak was a deliberate covert biological test of these organisms. Uh, but I would say that Dr. Cheney's evidence 
of having watching it spread across the USA looks more towards the accidental release theory. But um, because we were aware of this right from the start, and we were actually looking very strongly at Lyme disease, when the EBV syndrome became national news, uh, you know, it's funny, at the beginning of the outbreak, everybody it was like a mass exodus. People were bailing out of Lake Tahoe because nobody knew anything about this. Mm -hmm. And because it seemed to have emerged right here in Incline Village, people were scared and they were leaving. Well, as the Epstein-Barr virus got national attention, people all over the world heard about this. And then people started converging in droves on Dr. Cheney and Dr. Peterson's office because they were the only doctors looking into this syndrome. And as these people flew into Lake Tahoe, some of them arrived already diagnosed with Lyme disease. And I watched these people, and thanks to my sensitivity to mold, I was aware of the sick buildings. And as these people arrived and they started moving around Incline Village, I noticed that people with a, an official diagnosis of Lyme disease were the first discrete identified illness who were just as reactive to the moldy buildings as people with the mystery illness were. Mm. Um, I one of my friends with chronic Lyme said uh, when she walks into a mold building, she can immediately feel it. She says, mold is like my kryptonite, which is the feeling you have. I, it's like it immediately drags your immune system down and your limbs feel heavy because I've experienced it too. And it's, um, it's a really strange thing that you feel it so rapidly. I, I don't know if you've had that experience. Very much so. Yeah. In fact, um, that effect was so strong that I suggested to Dr. Cheney that we study it because at the very least, we can relieve ourselves of this burden if we know what's in the sick buildings and devise a strategy of what I called extreme mold avoidance to stay away from it. At least we don't have this in addition to whatever else is going on. Yeah. And at the yeah. time, toxic mold wasn't even discovered. It wasn't in the literature. There were no papers on the effects of trichothecenes and toxic mold until the following year, 1986. Mm -hmm. So when chronic fatigue syndrome researchers began to look in the literature, as far as they were concerned, mold was nothing more than an allergy. They dismissed it on that basis. And once they entrenched in their medical literature that th this was not any part of the chronic fatigue syndrome investigation, then it was artificially set aside because people looked at the Holmes definition and said, well, it doesn't say anything about mold, so therefore this is not part of CFS. When actually, the first clusters of the mystery illness were all in sick buildings, every one of them. In fact, the first one that was very well described at Truckee High School took place in a particular room. And it was nine teachers who all got sick in this one room where the rest of the school was relatively unaffected. Dr. Gary Holmes looked at this room. The teachers asked him specifically to look into mold, look into the air filters for the causative agent of whatever was making the difference for this room. And he looked at them like they were crazy. Mm -hmm. So when he went back to Atlanta and wrote his chronic fatigue syndrome definition, he completely left that out. And from that point on, chronic fatigue syndrome researchers analyzed the definition and treated that as being what chronic fatigue syndrome is. And they never came back to look at the circumstance which started it. In the meantime, we looked into the sick buildings, the schools did. And as the knowledge base of toxic mold developed over the next couple of years, we identified a particular black mold, Stachybotrys charterum, mm -hmm. as the primary neurotoxic agent responsible for causing these symptoms in people with a chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis. Yeah, and I, I think you're hitting on a point that makes um, these investigations really hard, especially as a citizen scientist. Um, uh, established scientists in academic institutions, they're used to studying one thing at a time. It's very reductionist, it's Cox postulate, 
isolate one thing and test it. And what we have is what I call a germ gangbang. I mean, it's a lot of factors and it makes it really hard to prove what's causing what. And the thing I found out is during my research is that they're, they were combining live organisms. So you had like the anti-crop research being done uh, in Wisconsin, and you had the anti-animal research being done on Plum Island, and then Fort Detrick was doing the anti-human research for biological and chemical weapons. And sometimes they would combine them. <laughs> so, you know, there were plans to, to do wheat rust, uh, spray it and release it with the Russians. And I'm sure there was anti-human, anti-animal um, plans to go along with that. So once all those things get out in nature, they mix. So you can see how maybe they use mold toxins for things. I know, I know one of the diabolical CIA plots to kill Fidel Castro was to spray a horrible, painful, disfiguring fungus on the inside of Fidel Castro's wetsuit since he likes to scuba dive a lot. So, you know, it's very, it's possible that they combine things, but it's so secret and a lot of those records were destroyed. So it's just a long and laborious thing. And that's what I found hard, challenging about the book is I couldn't absolutely prove everything absolutely, but at least I could build a story and show other accidents that happen. Yeah, accidents do happen a lot, especially when you have military involved. And, um, and I, I was very clear about, this is what we absolutely know. And this is what we don't know. And this is where I think we need more research. Yeah, having a, a background in biological weapons from the US Army, um, I can attest that anytime there's any interesting thing that can harm people, the military will try to turn it into a weapon. So, um, you know, it's, it's like a hobby with them. And uh, they, they put a lot of work into that. Where did you work? But I was in uh, Germany. I was in northern Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. My specialty was enhanced radiation weapons. Mm -hmm. So uh, not, not bugs, even though I did get a little peripheral uh, lesson in what bugs could do, because we were going to have to deal with that along with the radiation that was planning on being employed. But uh, yeah, my specialty was a charged particle weapon. Mm. Um, you've probably heard of it, the neutron bomb. Mm. Mm -hmm. So a very uh, exotic and bizarre, nasty way of, of um, killing people. It um, spares the buildings, but uh, kills the people. And I was amazed that during the Tahoe outbreak, when I saw a low level immune dysfunction spreading across the entire North Lake Tahoe region. I thought this was somewhat akin to what I was trained for and that all of a sudden people were complaining about every toxin, every virus, every bacterial infection, every fungus that you could possibly point at with the only common denominator being that it was all happening in the same geographic region at the same time. And, um, I think uh, you talk about the difficulty. Researchers complain all the time that they've got nothing to start with and it's too complex for them to handle. Well, if you start with any cluster, and it doesn't matter which one, Yarrington, Lindenville, Incline Village, if you start with the one clue and proceed from there, then it all kind of falls into a pattern and makes sense. Mm -hmm. Where they get into trouble is when they analyze all different clusters and it's like throwing a whole bunch of different puzzles into the same box and then trying to save, solve each, you know, each of them rather than just keeping each puzzle separate. So they've, they've worked themselves into a horrible mess and they don't seem to have any way of getting out of it. And during the uh, 1985 period when we, these clusters emerged and Dr. Cheney was tracking them in um, various parts of Nevada, in Boston, in New York and Los Angeles, because there was a huge EBV contingent in Los Angeles, up in Portland. There was also an outbreak in Silicon Valley, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, mm -hmm. the Silicon Valley area, which you're from. 
And we, we actually called it at the time, the Silicon Valley disease. Wow, what, what year was this? 1985. Huh. Hmm. Same time as ours. Hmm. And reports came up to us of the Silicon Valley disease. I thought that's fascinating with all those researchers down there. I'm sure they'll look into that and I've never been able to find any record of it. Yeah. Well, part of um, the deep research I did was, so when you have an outbreak, a cluster like this, how do you know if it's natural or unnatural? And I spoke to a guy who does that for a living um, with Bechtel and he had, he had an excellent paper, um, which is, his last name is Dembeck, D-M-B-K, Discernment Between Deliberate and Natural Infectious Disease Outbreaks, which is a, a really nice um, article and has some case studies, but he had like eight clues when you know it's, when you should highly suspect it's unnatural. And clue one is a highly unusual event with large numbers of casualties. Number two, higher morbidity or mortality than is expected sickness. Um, clue number three, uncommon disease. Clue number four, point source outbreak. And then clue number five, multiple epidemics. I mean, those were the main five that certainly relate to the Incline Village outbreak and the Boston area, three freaky tick-borne diseases just show up, which you, you, know, you can't say, oh, climate change would create three new diseases. It's not, it doesn't pass the sniff test really. You, I don't know if you've read anything or have any knowledge of the neutron bomb. And the military hated that expression. They didn't like it. They call it enhanced radiation weapon system. Mm -hmm. um, so we used to call it that all the time just to piss them off. So um, the point of the um, neutron bomb is a pretty devious, nasty thing. It wipes out an immune function. That's it. There's, hmm. there's no blast damage. There's no um, fires. In fact, there's very little signs that um, a weapon was deployed at all. Hmm. It's kind of like a lar large pop and then a flash of uh, alpha particles goes out and it wipes the immune system clean of any hmm. immune programming. So you essentially expire of your own opportunistic latent infections that you're keeping repressed. Uh, well, really, I'm really horrible. So <laughs> yeah, um, and it was expected with no immune function that you would probably uh, expire within a few hours, maybe a couple days. Mm -hmm. So we could uh, go in and take over the area, uh, reoccupy it, even take the uh, enemy's weapons there, the Soviet tanks, as this is primarily what it was designed for. It's to stop a Soviet tank column. Mm. And we could simply take their tanks and turn them around and use them against the, uh, the enemy. And one of the things that uh, they, they trained as a sign of if this weapon had ever been deployed was that everybody over a certain area was going to basically die of the common cold, that's side bar virus of the, the most ridiculous things and that doctors were going to seize upon whatever infection they could identify and blame that and not look for the larger pattern of people getting sick in a specific area. And I was, I was amazed at that. I go, you've got to be kidding me. You, you doctors won't question why somebody suddenly got Epstein-Barr virus and look deeper. And my trainers told me, no, they, uh, doctors are very single-minded that way. They will fixate on whatever they have a test for, and they won't look any further. Lo and behold, the in-kind village outbreak happens, and a new test was unleashed at that particular time, the Epstein-Barr virus serology test, which could detect fluctuating levels of Epstein-Barr virus plus a suppressed Epstein-Barr virus nuclear antigen which is what keeps EBV in restraint. Hmm. 
And what Dr. Paul Cheney found was that people all the way across North Lake Tahoe, whether they had any signs of illness or not, were suffering from a depressed Epstein-Barr virus nuclear antigen. He showed this to Dr. Gary Holmes, who didn't know what to make of it. So he wrote this paper called the Tahoe Study, went back to Atlanta and presented this to the CDC, who convened a Holmes committee where they got all these researchers together, designed this new syndrome, the chronic fatigue syndrome, as if they were going to investigate this outbreak. And that, from that point on, they only looked at the definition, their description of the symptoms, and never again came back to Lake Tahoe to analyze what had actually happened here. So thanks to my training, when I saw that everybody was suffering from reactivated Epstein-Barr virus, I looked around for other infections. And sure enough, saw reactivated cytomegalovirus, the newly discovered virus, the HHV6, fungal infections, bacteria, all these strange things happening. And that's when I began approaching uh, the new, because the name had never been used before, chronic fatigue syndrome doctors, and explaining them that if they come back, they can see a broad pattern of immune suppression occurring all the way across the North Lake Tahoe region within a year's span. Hmm. So that's been my goal ever since, is to try to get to attract researchers back to at least discuss this, try to make some sense out of this. Yeah, and I, I tried to look for um, open air tests from airplanes. And I actually did look at the incline village area thing. There's an excellent book, The Plut Plutonium Files, which I think won a Pulitzer, but that was about um, Amer America's large area coverage program. And they did a bunch of simulation tests where they spread cesium from planes over large cities. I and mean, they would pick cities that were equivalent to Russian cities. So St. Louis was one of them because that was a lot like Moscow. And so they would take planes, they would spread this cesium and they said, the scientists said, yeah, that's harmless. Later, we find out a lot of people under the planes got died of cancers, of course, because it's radioactive. So um, if anybody can get to these records of open air vulnerability tests, feasibility tests, it might shed some light on that. The documents are hard to get, but I tried to get some related to you know, the tick-borne disease issues. Have you seen uh, Don Scott's book, The Extremely Unfortunate Skull Valley Incident? I've read, I, I haven't read that book, but I've read extensively about Skull Valley. Uh, well, you know, based on what I read in Don Scott's book about the testing of these mycoplasma and various organisms, and when I combine that with Dr. Cheney's research and his test results, and the way the um, spread seems to be geographic across the United States, I tend to believe that this was not any kind of deliberate um, release of a biological agent, that something that they were playing with was a little more pathogenic than they anticipated, and it turned out to be contagious where they hadn't counted on that either. Yeah, that, that would be logical. Uh, I, there are several good examples of military tests where they thought the pathogens weren't pathogenic, but they were. So there was a ship that cruised up and, up and down the San Francisco Bay on the ocean and sprayed what they thought was a, a harmless um, simulant, of, simulant of, I think it was simulating anthrax, it was Seradia and a bacteria, a live bacteria. And then they had sniffers all over the Bay Area. And what they decided is you could spray like the city of San Francisco from a boat, a passing boat, and almost everybody be infected. And they thought, well, it's a harmless bacteria. But I mean, actually, people who are immunocompromised before got really sick and one person died at Stanford Hospital. So there's so many examples of that. There's one in the subway system of New York. Um, and then the Skull Valley, for people who aren't 
familiar with that, Dugway Proving Grounds in the middle of Utah was where they test a lot of dangerous pathogens and they were working on VX nerve gas, spraying it from planes and they were doing a demonstration for a high ranking military guy who was in town and they changed their direction and then there was a leak in the spraying mechanism. Um, they were spraying it on animals so you could see how effective it was at killing and uh, what happened is because of the change of winds, it, the gases went over to the next valley, which had a lot of mostly Basque farmers, cattle farmers and sheep farmers, and it killed all the sheep. Um, and it, well, it's more complicated than that, but uh, that was really the incident that motivated outrage in the world and motivated the US to cancel their biological warfare program. What's amazing about the Skull Valley, unfortunate Skull Valley incident book is that it describes my high school ground zero for chronic fatigue syndrome in great detail hmm. and mentions it as a possible covert test of these, uh, these organisms, mycoplasma in particular. Hmm. And I expected, wow, that means that a lot of people are going to be interested. They're going to ask questions. And to this day, no researcher has ever come back to Truckee High School to find out what happened. And I go, you know, we're still here, the survivors. I mean, we went through this thing. You can come back, you can go to the very spot, you can ask us and we can tell you all about it. And they, they adamantly refused to come. Now this um, Operation Sea Spray, the ship off the, uh, of San Francisco that was spraying the Seradia, Marsaisins, um, people point at that and go, well, see, that proves that the military is willing to conduct these horrible experiments on people. And as you've noted, at the time, this particular bacteria, Seradia, uh, it forms red colonies in a Petri dish. And so you can easily look at how vigorous a microbial colony of this is. And it was actually used in high school biology classes back in the 1950s to demonstrate antibiotic resistance because you could grow this serati in a petri dish, expose it to various antibiotics, and then take the survivors, grow it, and demonstrate that it had acquired antibiotic resistance. And since this bacteria was so commonly used in these biological, you know, I mean, this uh, high school biology classrooms, the military said, yeah, this isn't going to harm anybody. And as you say, as a result of this experiment, it was affecting immune compromised people and some people died from it. And that was all hushed up. But it, I don't believe that the military had any really nasty intentions when they did this. They just weren't really quite aware of how much damage it would actually cause. I agree. And um this all these most of these experiments were done 50 years ago and by law you should uh, declassify these documents after like 35 37 years it's not like people are going to use this data attack us there's so many better weapons now so i i just think it would do a lot of good to declassify this whole class of documents so that scientists could get to the bottom of why these outbreaks happened say instead of we're just fishing in the dark right now, but know what was released when, and did they develop any protective um, research, vaccines, treatments for the soldiers? Because they would never deploy a weapon unless they could protect their own. And it'd be great if that was all declassified. Yeah, the um, thrust of the biological warfare training that I received is that, um, hot zones, radioactive zones would be deadly for weeks, months, or possibly years after a neutron burst. So part of this strategy was to become aware of these so that soldiers could avoid them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was a little concerned about the civilians. What are you gonna do about them? And they yeah. explained that thanks to your training, your ability to recognize the signs of a biological warfare incident, you will know how to avoid hot zones. Mm -hmm. 
and you will pass this on to the civilian population and they'll be able to take advantage of this. So in essence, the people who have been trained in biological warfare will become the leaders in, a, in the aftermath of a hmm. biological warfare scenario. Hmm. So given this, when I realized that I had this incredible reactivity to a particular toxic mold, I started what I called the chronic fatigue syndrome mold um, history tour, <laughs> where I would take people diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome to these very buildings where the clusters had occurred so I could observe whether they were reactive to this toxic mold or not. <laughs> Lo and behold, they were extremely so. <laughs> so I began teaching them how to avoid toxic mold. That's the basics of, basis of extreme mold avoidance. Hmm. And my story is in four of Dr. Shoemaker's books, Desperation hmm. Medicine, Surviving Mold, um, Mold Warriors. And he's backed off from mold quite a bit in his recent book, The Art and Science of SIRS, uh, chronic, chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. But he still gives me a, a bit of a mention there. Mm -hmm. And to my way of thinking, the most remarkable phenomenon of all is not the illness itself. It's the fact that this incident is so prominently featured in the literature, and yet not a chronic, not a single researcher has ever come back to try to sort any of this out. Yeah, and if we release those documents, it might spawn 10,000 theses from new scientists that aren't afraid of losing NIH funding. But I, I wanted to read this one part. It reminded me of the hot zone point you were making. This is from an army report in 1959 about why we should weaponize fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes, which are arth arthropods, eight-legged creepy things. Okay, the advantage of arthropods as bioweapons carriers are these. They inject the agent directly into the body so that a mask is no protection to a soldier and they will re remain alive for some time, keeping an area constantly dangerous. So it's what you're saying about hot, hot zones. You know, if we can release that information, we know where the hot zones are, we can nuke the bugs, uh, know how to treat the people who've been bitten. Well, in your bitten interview, you talked about the need for uh, basically a study of researchers to, to find out if they're competent to be in the profession that they are. And do you have any um, avenue to exploration of how we can study, how we can look into the behavior of researchers to determine the sociological reasons for their complete failure to follow up on our evidence? Well, I, I think it's mostly the system is flawed and uh, there's so much competition for very few NIH grants. So nobody wants to make waves, uh, be too daring. Uh, in the case of Willie Bergdorfer, he worked for the NIH. It started out as the public health service. They were a contractor for the bioweapons program, as were 50 of our top universities. Um, most of the university researchers didn't know why they were doing a certain assignment for the military because it was compartmentalized and secret. But uh, right now it's a shameful past. And, and if you're a young researcher, you don't want to ask too many questions or you, you won't get one of those limited 10, 10 year slots. You won't get one of those limited R01 NIH grants. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, suppression just from the, the competition for grants and the fact that if you dare to delve into some of these things, well, your own colleagues might destroy you. I wrote yeah. down two, two quotes, one from your documentary and one from your book that I just, I think are really relevant to this point in the conversation. And I just wanna read them to you guys. From the documentary, somebody asks a question. I didn't write his name down. You could, you could probably tell me who it is once you hear this. What kind of a breakdown or series of breakdowns in the medical system can lead to a setting where you have an illness and people going to their average doctor's offices and they may or may not be likely to get effective treatment for it? And then, so that was from Under Our Skin, the documentary. And then I heard this quote 
from the book that I feel like in part at least answers this question that was posed in the beginning of the documentary and it says in regards to researchers that are partnering with big pharma we essentially lost our system of scientific checks and balances and this in turn has undermined patient trust in the institutions that are supposed to do no harm yeah and i i think eric uh probably shares the same opinions that I do about the CDC. And, and that is, where have they been, you know, during these outbreaks? Like, why, why aren't they asking the questions? It's supposed to be their job to, I mean, the CDC was originally founded to be on the lookout of biological weapons accidents. That's, that was its sole purpose. Now it's expanded to uh, making sure you have clean swimming pools <laughs> and, and don't get salmonella from turtles. But anyways, um, this is job one for CDC. And why are they obstructionists with health information rather than uh, being helpful? <laughs> yeah, and that's important for people to understand is that the CDC are obstructionists. They're fully aware of this. They actually did a, a very good investigation of the uh, Lake Tahoe outbreak and uh, the starting point of the home CFS definition was more than adequate for a researcher to understand that some weird suppression of immune function was going on and provide a context for following up on that investigation. So I think what happened was with the CDC is <coughs> their initial investigation they thought that people were eventually going to look into it, but they created this vague construct, this uh, ridiculous name for a, a vague syndrome. And when they found out that no doctors were going to follow up, no researchers were going to ask any question, they decided to treat the vague definition as a settled matter. And that's when they contrived the Fukuda 1994 definition mm -hmm. Because if you ask yourself, why did they do that? Why did they redefine chronic fatigue syndrome when they didn't add any value? They didn't put any more evidence into it. They didn't refine the scope of the investigation in any way. In fact, they completely omitted all of the evidence that engendered the original Holmes definition. So what was the point? Well, it turns out that was the point. It was to get rid of all the original evidence so that people would never again look at the original chronic fatigue syndrome incident and from then on they would regard Fukuda CFS as being the embodiment of what chronic fatigue syndrome was. Quite an amazing deception. Yeah, I know. I, I, I have some friends at the CDC. They're very smart and so I I question some of their motivations. <laughs> yeah, um, going further into that, I'm just really curious if you are comfortable that, to answer this, um, you know, kind of hearing Eric's story, knowing what you know through your extensive research into Lyme, how do you think or how do you feel the CDC, the NIH, like how they're dealing with the current state of affairs in the country with COVID? Well, I just think it's been a massive botch. Um, and I think with the Lyme people, we, we had already lost faith in the CDC. Um, it wasn't as obvious to people on the outside because Lyme disease like CFS is an invisible disease. Our children aren't born with tiny heads. Uh, we don't have lesions all over us. Uh, it's, it's an invisible disease. And so, and it's slow. You don't die of Lyme disease, usually you die like complications of it. So when the COVID vaccine came, I think all the weaknesses, you know, it's like a dam that had a lot of hidden cracks. So with COVID happened, like all the cracks were completely obvious with the CDC. So I think the good part of that is maybe they'll fix, the, you know, fix the things that are broken and that'll help Lyme patients and CFS patients too. But um, 
yeah, no wonder they're having trouble. <laughs> I mean, masks or no masks, aerosol or not, uh, vaccine or not, you know, so uh, yeah, they've lost complete faith and it. I hope they get someone competent in there to try and restore faith because it's so much, it's so much easier to lose confidence than get it back. So it'll be 10 times more work to get the American people to trust them. Exactly. Yeah, I propose to uh, CDC officials, because every once in a while, they make a token appearance in Incline Village. I mean, mm -hmm. they have to go through the motions of acting like they really want to solve it, when they really don't, of course. So mm -hmm. they show up in Incline Village, and I ambush them. And I actually get to have some very good discussions with them. And I offer them to chance to come back and clear this up. I go, look, so much time has, has passed. I mean, you can't really hold people accountable in the way that we could many years ago. So if the Center for Disease Control were to come back and clear up this matter, it would do wonders for their credibility. And I think they thought about it for a while and then decided that no, because to do that, they would have to admit that a cover-up had taken place. Mm -hmm. I know, and well, fear of lawsuits, I think that's been a force of evil. <laughs> I mean, you saw it with um, thinking about other chemical biological weapons. We saw it with Agent Orange. There's been lit litigation against the military for the harm done to our soldiers for deploying Agent Orange. We've seen it with the LSD experiments that was through Fort Detrick with a unit of the CIA that was embedded in there. So the fear of lawsuits with MECFS and um, Lyme disease related things uh, would be great. Well, my point in starting the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, because I was asked by Dr. Paul Cheney to assist in providing the evidence that would force the Center for Disease Control into admitting that there was something going on here. So they, they had my blood, they had my evidence, they lifted my symptoms right out of my chart for use in the Holmes definition. And it was compelling. And they did proceed to, you know, act like they wanted to solve this at some point. But my primary focus was what on earth is going on in these sick buildings? Because at the time, all the doctors, all the researchers from all over the world, they read about clusters in certain buildings, we, which we even identified as being sick buildings. And it never occurred to any researchers to actually go into the buildings and try to identify a causative agent. None. They became so fixated on their viruses that they completely lost sight of the clusters. And I thought at the very least, I can explain to them that there are certain species of molds that are more pathogenic th than others. Mm -hmm. The one that we found in particular, the Stachybotrys, I can draw attention to that. And then people can at least understand a portion of what's going on here and take control of their illness to the extent that this, these particular neurotoxic molds are affecting them, get out of houses or places of employment where they're being affected by toxic black mold. And at least I can help to, to that extent. And to my amazement, I got zero cooperation from the chronic fatigue syndrome world and some cooperation, just a little bit from the mold world until they found out that my story was getting some traction and they decided I was getting too big for my britches or something because they decided to completely drop that. And now all investigation into the connection between chronic fatigue syndrome and the toxic black mold has been dropped by all parties concerned. So yeah, that's so, what Go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, something I think about a lot is how to fix these situations. Uh, it, they're just so complicated and there's so much history and embarrassment. And like one day I get this call at work and it's from 212 and I'm thinking, oh, it's another spam call. And I'm not, I'm almost didn't answer it. And I answered it. It's like, hello, this is Senator so-and-so who was talking about 
what would be involved in declassifying these biological weapons experiments and we were brainstorming a little bit and and one thing i thought about is like what if we just package the investigation with an amnesty program for the people involved i mean a lot of the people involved are dead now uh, but isolate them from lawsuits for the sins of our cold war fathers um, so he thought about that of course the the investigation got uh, canned because it was in the middle of the Trump stuff. But uh, a lot of people I suggested this to are mad because they want retribution punishment. But at a certain point, we just have to say, there are just so many sick people out there and we need to do something about it ASAP. Otherwise, we're just, it'll drag the whole economy down. We already have um, the most expensive and one of the least effective healthcare systems. And uh, we just need to move forward somehow. So that's yeah. what I, I have a plea in my epilogue in my book. This is what it, needs to happen. We need scientists to fire up the gene sequencers and figure out what is in the ticks, because it's not just Lyme. There's other really bad stuff in there. We need to open kimono on all these experiments so we can get to the root of the problems, incline village, et cetera. Yeah, the Invictus plan, where, <laughs> yeah. where we uh, just basically forgive them. So as, as you say, most of the principles, nearly all of them, in the original chronic fatigue syndrome cover-up, they're gone. They're mm -hmm. dead. They're retired. Mm -hmm. They're out of the picture. So now we have to do with pick people who are blindly, or maybe not so blindly, carrying on a policy that's based on a false premise. It's very difficult to get them out of this. Mm -hmm. If there's one one more thing that I wanted to cover is the Silicon Valley disease. Hmm. Because at the same time Incline Village was happening, I was traveling through Silicon Valley regularly, and I noticed that I was getting sick every time I passed through. Hmm. And with a little bit of research, I found out that being Silicon Valley, there was a huge black market in uh the washing of silicon chips and all mm -hmm. the trading for the various computers that was going on. And they were using vast amounts of solvents, trichloroethylene, toluene, washing these chips and flushing it right down the toilet into the uh, water supply. Mm -hmm. And this emerged in the water table, remains a problem to this day. And I found the locations that were making me sick were the areas likeliest to have been involved in this illegal silicon washing trade. Hmm. And when I try to engage researchers in that, I get the same response as I do for anything else. They don't really want to talk about it. But there's a lot of people who are sick down in Silicon Valley right now with a mystery illness, and they're getting no answers. and Their doctors aren't telling them about this. Yeah, and uh, one thing this whole process has taught me is uh, n most people don't want to look down the dark rabbit holes. They just don't. <laughs> so it's just a few weird people that are very curious. They won't take no. So more power to you for keeping up the fight. Same with the mold people. It's, it's affecting so many lives dragging the economy down, ruining families. So when are the people going to rise up and say is enough is enough? And can we use some creative thinking to get around these obstacles? Yeah, we might even make the point that if doctors are such obstructionists toward resolving some of these illnesses, we could even say that they're a threat to national security. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I know Keely touched on this a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, Eric fighting the good fight for 35 years, he, <laughs> he has gotten so many people upset and people have been trying to squash him out of the picture and trying to dump, you know, what, what is known. And, um, I'm just curious, like, 
what was your feeling when you decided to release this book and what was the response that you were you were getting from just from everyone institutions doctors researchers patients uh it, that was super interesting uh i all the Lyme patients applauded it so i had my fan base uh i had it was it was initially greeted as craziness and uh I was doing it for the big bucks, not that nonfiction books earn money, um, but uh, it was pretty re revelatory. Uh, I go to this infection or investigative reporters conference and they suggest when you publish a controversial book, do a FOIA on the response in the government agency to your book. So I did that to the CDC and the NIH and uh, I, I, NIH was fast. CDC, as usual, never responds to me anymore. <laughs> and just put it in a dark drawer. So I, I get this big stack of emails that mention my book and my name. And I open up the um, and I look at it and I just felt like throwing up. <laughs> it was just I wanted to crawl under my covers for a couple months. But then when I calmed down, I put the emails in chronological logical order and it was fascinating in that when the book began to be marketed which was in january through when it was shipped in may the nih was going ape shit about the book saying she's a yellow journalist she doesn't know what she's doing she's making stuff up she's doing it for the benjis which are 100 dollars bills uh and then can we sue her <laughs> it was like my worst nightmares but i had been so careful about being factual and uh, Harper Collins, I sat down with their legal team and we just absolutely made sure everything was solid and took out a bunch of stuff that was gray area. So then the book came out and the NIH at the highest levels at Rocky Mountain Lab where Willie really worked had a big legal meeting where they were going to talk about suing me. And then after that, absolute radio silence. I, I wasn't, I didn't have the emails from that secret meeting, but they just didn't publicly mention the book again. So I, I take that as a sign that they didn't want to give that book oxygen because there was too much truth in it. Uh, and, but then there's some, I, I believe there was damage control that was done on the sly in that a professor from Tufts wrote an op-ed uh, saying that it was bogus, uh, there were, inaccuracies in that uh i called the washington post science editor and said you know there's these things wrong with it can you retract it because it linked to my book and they said no that's an op-ed and we don't fact check op-eds this is the washington post and then i called the author of the op-ed and he's a professor who teaches biosecurity so he knows more than most people he is now the director of a a bio level three, four lab, Tufts, I'm not sure if it's four, but uh, I called him and said, hey, there's some inaccuracies in this op-ed. Uh, did you actually read my book? And he goes, oh no, I don't have time to read books. This is a professor who teaches, <laughs> who's a vet, he's a tick specialist and he didn't read the book, but he wrote an op-ed criticizing it. So uh, he's funded by the NIH and the military. And why did he write that? I, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but I suspect he was put up to it. Well, thank you for being extremely brave. Um, I, I think if everyone acted the way you've been in this situation with Lyme, we'd be in a, a, a very different world <laughs> right now. I think a lot of people are scared. A lot of people are, are driven by fear and you know they're driven by money and power and they would rather put that on a pedestal than the truth and i think like us me keely eric we've all been mold injured and like you you've been lyme injured yourself mm -hmm. and that has thwarted you on this journey to finding the truth trying to figure out what's going on and so in a way we're we're doing the same thing but with mold and we're we're not getting the 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 lashings or 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 um such like a negative feedback from, from people quite yet. We are getting very popular and 
we're not stopping and we're getting people like you on who are just as brave, who is amazing, who has done a lot of work. And I'm just really curious as to what are you working on now? Are you continuing doing more research into Lyme? Are you now focusing your efforts more into like finding things that could help Lyme patients? Or I'm just very curious of what you're working on currently. Uh, yeah. So I, <laughs> Of the chronically ill, I mean, we have to make a living somehow when our health isn't hundred percent. So I'm, I'm working half time for Invisible International, which is a really great nonprofit. And they're working to get justice and research for people with invisible diseases, like the tick-borne diseases, Bartonella, we may get into mold. So in, as a communications director there, it's really great because I get to look at the latest research and write about it on the blog, um, trying to get donations for their really good research. Uh, so that's my halftime job. And then the other half, I'm working on my um, personal passion investigations. So a little bit of Lyme disease, um, and they're making a documentary off the book Bitten. So supporting the, document, the, the documentary team um, as they work on that which was slowed down with COVID. <laughs> awesome. Could you speak maybe a little bit more about um, your in, in, Invisible International um, nonprofit organization? And, and you know maybe that's something we can connect our audience members to because we have a lot of audience members that are suffering with Lyme issues mm -hmm. that are stuck in the wind. <laughs> they don't know where to go. You know, the, the end all be all treatment is doxycycline, but it doesn't work for everyone. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but I'm, I'm very active on Lyme groups and I, I just look at what people talk about. And mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of the Lyme doctors are being, their, their medical licenses are being plucked away from them. Um, mm -hmm. the Lyme doctors that are actually successful uh, in, in treating people. Um, so where can people find resources to, to get better and maybe some more guidance and help? Is it through your nonprofit that you're working with? Yeah, so Invisible International, they have, uh, their first program was getting uh, continuing education courses from the best clinicians in the field and the best researchers in the field. And so they're medical education courses that are accredited. So if you're a doctor, you can listen to them and get credit for continuing education. Um, patients can watch them for free also. You just have to register. And we're right now we're specializing in Bartonella and the tick-borne diseases and really Right now, there's sort of a blockade for these alternative or the minority report that says, hey, the tests are bad in Lyme and it's uh, Lyme disease is an immune disabler and uh, chronic Lyme does exist. And this is these are some ways to treat it. Those are things that are not getting into journal <laughs> JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine. They're just they're too controversial for strange reasons. But so anybody can watch that and patients can watch it and force their doctors to watch it and everything will be better. The other thing, um, the founder of Invisible International was a Harvard doctor, is, was a Harvard doctor and um, she's trying to get research. Um, right now, for example, chronic Lyme, there was no medical reimbursement code for chronic Lyme. So all that data on these patients is lost to people, big data researchers. So what she's trying to do is set up 10 sites around the US of the best physicians treating these diseases. One on neurological Lyme, one on pediatric Lyme, those two are at Harvard, uh, one on the West Coast and take their medical records and start putting that data in the cloud. So now any, collecting this data is the expensive part. So now any clinician or researcher can access that with permission and start making conclusions like, are there geographic clusters for certain symptoms for these tick-borne diseases? Um, do, which drugs are working? Which combination of drugs are, are working? There has been no treatment trials for more than 20 years for, for chronic Lyme. We're just working on mice who don't get very sick. So we're making that um, widely <laughs> um, accessible. Then we're trying to start a mental health problem because it turns out that if you have chronic Lyme, there's, or if you're diagnosed with Lyme, there's a 75% chance, you have 75% more chance of committing suicide. So we're 
talking about doing a, a blueprint for mental health counseling for tick-borne disease patients. So those are the main things we're working on. Um, and it's mostly trying, we need more treating clinicians. So we're trying to educate them. We're trying to um, grow our own. Yeah, definitely. And just to go back to what I mentioned earlier, is it true that they are cracking down on Lyme literate doctors, the medical so, board? Um, so I've been in this battle for 17 years trying to find solutions. And to me, it's about the same rate uh, of trying to go after people's license who treat. We see that with people treating with ivermectin now with COVID. Uh, I don't know, there's just some zealots. They're, they're not really reading the literature, I think. Yeah, I hear you. Now, um, I know that we went above and beyond the hour, and thank you so much. Um, was there anything else that you guys wanted to ask uh, Chris? Or Chris, was there anything else that you wanted to mention? Um, I would say if you think you have tick-borne diseases, uh, go to LymeDisease.org. They have a really good uh, question, uh, a questionnaire that helps you figure out, do you have a tick-borne disease? They help you get doctors and insurance coverage. And then if you want to invest in research, my foundation, Invisible International is good. Also Bay Area Lyme Foundation, Global Lyme Alliance, they're doing some really good investments in research because we need, we desperately need research. I just analyzed NIH grants for Lyme disease. And in the last five years, only 0.3% of the budget has been spent on human treatment studies. So we have all these chronic Lyme patients and only 0.3% of our, our lousy, tiny Lyme disease budget at the NIH is being spent. It's I just, it's care. ridiculous. I mean, we, we have really healthy mice, but <laughs> not humans. <laughs> I know. It's just, it's crazy because I, um, again, I'm a part of those Lyme groups on social media and it's like everyone's saying how the Lyme population has just exploded on the East Coast. They're finding more ticks like on the beach in California. And I'm just like, if this problem is getting exponential, then the funding should follow the issue, mm -hmm. right? But right. It's not there, but thank you again for being so dedicated to the cause. And I, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal the term citizen scientist because I really love that. I think if we want any meaningful research done that's gonna go for the truth and not for special interests, um, I think we need to emerge citizens becoming scientists and aligning with people who have same interests, who have the funds to be able to put towards this information because as we're seeing for a lot of different things in our government organizations, their, their motivations aren't for really helping. Um, I, don't know, I don't really know what their money's going for and who it's really helping. I, maybe we know, right, Big Pharma, <laughs> um, definitely for them. Um, so, you know, thank you again for everything that you're doing and that you continue to do. Um, we'd love to partner with you in any way, shape or form because Lime and Mold seem to go like this. I'm yeah. um, not sure yeah. if you're familiar with Brian Rosner's work. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he wrote some books about his Lyme disease um, clearing up with mold avoidance, being in pristine locations. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a pretty fascinating um, concept. Um, I don't know, what do you think about that actually? I'm really interested in what you think about Brian Rosner's work. Um, I, I just know of him, I don't know it in detail. I do know that in, at Invisible International, I've been um, spending a lot of time on Zoom with Dr. Charlotte Mao, who's a pediatrician at Spalding. It's an affiliated hospital in Boston with Harvard. And she's, she's just finding more and more Lyme patients can be brought back to health if you address the mold things too. So now mold is her religion, which is great. And she's really thinking hard about what is the the mechanism that mold would make people sick. Um, so she's a very deep thinker. Uh, so I'm really hoping she comes out with some research on that. So anyways, mold and Lyme together, <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it, it, I guess it would be the perfect biological warfare agent. You know, let's, let's inject these ticks, 
let's spread them out. Everyone is in a processed home these days. You know, let, let's see what the interaction between the mycotoxins and the mold and the, and the, and the bacterial disease, you know, it's like, I don't know. Who knows what's going on these days? I mean, yeah, it's, it's complicated, like, but we, we've had flooding it. with flooding. Uh, it's going to be a super bad year. And I think a lot of the, um, the real estate and the insurance business is fighting against uncovering the truth. Oh, definitely. I mean, if in California, if you get a mold test, then you have to reveal it. If there's any mold, then forget about selling your house uh, insurance companies don't want to pay for the treatment. I mean, that's, I'm sure you guys know that, but. Uh, we learned some really interesting things from Eric when we explored some of the original data from chronic fatigue syndrome that pointed to almost a type of chemically induced AIDS that may or may not be from the trichothecenes that Stachybotrys produces, those mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. And so, I've definitely pondered over the question extensively. Is this weakening our immune system so that the other pathogens that we've been exposed to are now the puppet masters of our body? And is that the connection between Lyme and mold? We would be grateful and honored to have an introduction to the pediatrician that you referenced and maybe have a conversation with her or do a podcast with her. This is, I think, the missing link for a lot of Lyme patients that are chronically sick, and mm -hmm. especially in terms of the residual contamination that can't be tested for or seen, but can still cause ill health effects. That's something that um, myself and Eric and Alicia all are just, we really have to live and die by it, um, using our senses to, you know, you said you can walk into a, a moldy room and, and know if there's mold in the building. We can, we're, we've been so sensitized that if I had this table here and it was in a stachybotrys house for a period of time, this table would cause my, would, I would react to this table intensely. And mm -hmm. I think that's an issue that's, it's so hard to prove. It sounds so crazy. It's so outside of the box that it's, it's kind of missed. And it's, a, I think, a very big missing link for, for chronically ill people, Lyme and others. Honestly, I agree. It's a missing link. I mean, it might be nice just at invisible to do a mold lecture on our CME. I mean, you might want to think about that. Yeah, we would love to do that. We yeah, would love to do that. Anything that we can do to get the word out about this. That's what we want to do. That's why we're doing this. Yeah, I'll suggest it. Uh, that is a really good idea. That would be great. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we <laughs> We've interviewed so many people and we know who the good and the bad are. <laughs> yeah. So we need we someone. They're, 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 you know, yeah. the industry bought uh, experts that are very decorated. We know those and we know the actual ones that, you know, are like, no, mold is a problem. So <laughs> yeah, we can steer you guys in the right direction. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll suggest it. It's a really good idea. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Yeah. Well, thank you for the invitation. I, uh, I feel like, Mold people are my kindred spirits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <has> too. <laughs> we have totally. a lot of the same obstruction to science. I know you guys are wrapping up, but I just wanted to say this one last thing. The way, you know, the way that you, you've you seen, like, the, the what is it, the ISDA? I don't know if ID, I... IDSA, Infectious ID, Diseases okay. Society of America. The way that you saw them kind of hold the line of, like, this is the information that you can have, and this is what we're not going to talk about and what we're not going to research. We see, we see, like, fake professionals holding those same lines with certain things about mold that aren't being honestly told. And so we see those same, those same obstructions and problems applied. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. It's getting to the point where you can't, you just can't ignore the, the mold factor anymore because of what you said, the, the flooding, you know, if you go right now and you Google mold and Google news, you're going to see schools, courthouses, police departments, firehouses, I mean, public housing, everyone has a mold problem these days. And as Eric says, he's never seen this, this many like stories of, of mold issues in his entire, as he's been going through this 30 years of let's look into the mold uh, factor. And so, 
it's just going to get worse. Um, and I would highly encourage you um, maybe to just uh, listen to our other episodes I can send over because Eric does have a running theory about why mold hmm. and microbes are getting out of control. And it really is stemming from like our pollution, you know, from combustion. Um, Toxins, like, pesticides, toxins, we're, yeah, we're just I mean, they're all just creating these virulent pathogens and mold is growing in weird places that we've never seen before. We actually posed a question to our audience members the other day. What's the craziest place you found mold in? You know, one gal said in her TV, she took apart her flat screen TV and it was full of mold. I'm like, what? How yeah. does that There's no wood in there, you know? It's just, yeah. it's crazy. But, but also we have electronic products coming from humid places like Vietnam and then coming to here and the molds in there. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. But thank you again, Chris. I'm just going to go ahead and record our outro really quickly. If that's okay with you. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you again, everyone for joining us today. We had Chris Newby on the author of Bitten and Under Our Skin documentary. She's got some more work coming out. So please check that out. Also go to Invisible International if you are looking for resources on how to treat your Lyme. Um, Bay Area Lyme Group, LymeDisease.org. There's so many different organizations that um, are just trying to help and find solutions and answers, just like us moldies. So thank you again, everyone. Let's rise up. Let's be citizen scientists here. Let's take back science and put out some good information so that way we can actually get some help around here. How about that? Please check out our GoFundMe and Patreon pages. Like, share, subscribe to our content. And uh, stay tuned because we have more wonderful guests coming on in the future. Thank you again.